Good evening. Sorry for our delay. We had some technical difficulties, but it should be under control now. My name is Ken Reinhard. I direct the UCLA program in experimental critical theory, and I want to welcome you tonight on behalf of the Hammer Museum. I want to thank Claudia Bestor and the Hammer Museum staff for hosting and co-sponsoring tonight's talk by Frank Wilderson. I also want to thank the UCLA Departments of English and Comparative Literature, the 1939 Society Chair in Holocaust Studies, and the UCLA Luskin Center for History and Policy for their support. Frank B. Wilderson III is Chancellor's Professor and Chair of African American Studies and a core member of the Faculty for Culture and Theory PhD program at UC Irvine. He is the author of books including Red, White, and Black, Cinema and the Structure of U.S. Antagonisms, which came out in 2010, Incognito Negro, a memoir of exile and apartheid, which came out in 2015, and of course, Afro-Pessimism, which came out in 2020. Frank spent five and a half years in South Africa, where he was one of two Americans to hold elected office in the African National Congress during the apartheid era. And he also served as a cadre in the underground MK paramilitary guerrilla group led by Nelson Mandela. He has also worked as a dramaturg for Lincoln Center Theater and as a film director. His many literary awards include the American Book Award, the Zora Neale Hurston Richard Wright Legacy Award for Creative Nonfiction, the Maya Angelou Award for Best Fiction Portraying the Black Experience in America, and a National Endowment for the Arts Literature Fellowship. As of September uh, 2020, Afro-pessimism has been long listed for the National Book Award in the nonfiction category. Frank Wilderson is one of the most important critical theorists of our time, a powerful contributor to the intersection of psychoanalysis, Marxism, and radical Black thought. His ideas and writing testify to the enormous and perhaps intractable difficulties that our hopes for racial justice must face and they give us the courage to face them. His talk tonight is entitled Afro-Pessimism and the Status of the Subject. Let me ask you, uh, if you have a question, please type it in the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen, and I will do my best to pass these questions on to Frank. So in your virtual locations, please join me in welcoming Frank B. Wilderson III. Thank you, Ken. Am I audible? I am, okay. Well, thank you very much to you and Claudia and Janani and everyone else at the Hammer Museum who uh, made this event possible. And um, again, my apologies also for the uh, technical difficulties that uh, caused this to be uh, somewhat delayed. So without, um, any further ado, let me just reiterate the title of what we're talking about today is Afro-Pessimism and the Status of the Subject. And the reason for that is because one of the more trenchant contributions that Afro-Pessimism has made to the way how thought is thought is its contribution to the question of what does it mean to be? What does it mean to be a subject of relational dynamics? And is it true that anyone who is a sentient being is also a relational being? These are the very kind of uh, assumptive logics and foundational logics of the humanities that we who study Afro-pessimism and write about it are actually challenging. So I have a much longer kind of preamble, but in the interest of time, what I'm gonna do instead is um, share with you a, a kind of a redacted correspondence between myself and, and a psychoanalyst uh, who wrote to me 
after one of my talks, because I think the questions and the issues that this person raises and the way in which she and I engage each other on this will go a long way in, uh, a, in having a kind of dialogic framing of what I'm gonna be trying to say today and when I get into the uh, more dramatic example of what I'm arguing. So let me just share my screen and, and go to that so you can read along with me uh, as I articulate it. Um, okay. And I'm sure that someone uh, at UCLA will tell me if this is not uh, able to be seen here. Um, dear Dr. Wilderson, can you say more about Afro-pessimism and the premise? If I understand you correctly, that anti-Blackness will always exist in the unconscious of humanity because the unconscious per psychoanalytic and Marxist theory is constructed in opposites, where that which is consciously accepted as its opposite rendered abject and located in the unconscious. I understand you to say that as a result from the Afro-pessimist point of view, reparation is impossible. As a psychoanalyst, there are aspects to this theory that are part of psychoanalysis, but these aspects do not speak to the totality of psychoanalytic theory, nor do they relate to the transformational process in analytic practice, where mechanisms of splitting in the psyche between good and bad, acceptable, abject, love versus hate are worked through and what has been dissociated or repressed as abject is recovered and interrogated in the psyche. I want to stop here for a minute because this last sentence is uh, really important in, in her, art, in her uh, letter to me because in point of fact, it is the um, impossibility of a kind of essential working through that she's talking about, which we're arguing that the Black Imago presents to the unconscious writ large, as well as to, in other words, to collective libidinal economy, as well as to individual uh, psyches. It is this process of working through to recover certain words that have um, become abject and make them part of the integrated uh, integrity of the psyche, that's exactly what we're arguing is at stake here and really not able to um, go through with for the Black subject. She writes, I was left feeling there was little hope for genuine societal transformation by the Afro-pessimist point of view. Did I understand this correctly? So then I respond, dear doctor, name redacted, thank you for your, your intervention. I'm sorry to tell you, okay, I'm not too, I'm not sorry to tell you, uh, smiley face, that in fact, you did understand what I was saying. I've attached a copy of my second book, uh, that's red, white, and black, where you can read the chapter titled The Narcissistic Slave that details specifically with an Afro-pessimist interrogation of psychoanalysis without, ha uh, without, however, throwing the baby out with the bathwater. But to know the source from which I draw my arguments, you should read chapter six of Fanon's Black Skin, White Mass, The Negro and Psychopathology, and then read the David Marriott on Black Men, where he argues that the Black unconscious is always already intruded upon, overdetermined by a need to destroy or garrison itself against its own Black imago. Fanon also makes these points in The Woman of Color and the White Man, which is also in black skin, white mass. But Fanon is a humanist who does not always comprehend or appreciate the tiger that he has by the tail. So to the heart of the matter, as you have in your email, we do not believe in the essential transformative capacity of the psychoanalytic encounter, the way that say Lacan does when he explicates the analytic encounter that over time helps the analyst on move from empty speech to full speech in any creed simply because the signifier does not slide when it is the N-word or any word that marks blackness qua slaveness is deployed. And this is another important uh, fact that, uh, argument actually that we'll come back to uh, in the Q&A if you want to. Um, for there to be a community of sentient beings for whom psychic 
social, and political transformation is possible once they learn how to harness the tools of language, the symbolic order in ways that do not entify the signifier, that is ways that do not fill it up with meaning so as to fortify and extend egoic monumentalization. For there to, for there to be a community of sentient beings who are endowed with this kind of transformative capacity, there has to be an ensemble of sentient beings who are so comprehensively subjugated by a kind of a signifying violence or gratuitous violence that they have no access to the world of sentient beings endowed with transformative capacity. In the modern world, or more precisely since 625 AD, when the Arabs rocked up on East African shores, this sentient being has been and remains the black essential transform transformative capacity, the capacity to live in a communal relation with what Lacan calls one's contemporaries or what we might call simply civil society, can only gain legibility if there is an ensemble of sentient beings who are barred ab initio, which is to say from the beginning, from such a word, world. Again, to be mindful of the level of abstraction that the word essential implores us to have this discussion. We must be mindful of that. There are important but inessential transformative encounters and outcomes. But if we get slap happy about what they pretend, we will disavow the essential structure of anti-Blackness and a world elaborated, fortified, and extended by anti-Blackness. I go on to say, uh, as you can see in my chapter, The Narcissistic Slave, this sentient being who has no essential transformative, no essential access to transformative capacity is the global foil against which all other beings can live out their neurotic stagnation or their psychic transformation. Again, please keep the word essential in mind when you read my work and the work of David Marriott. I've attached one of his early chapters, Frantz Fanon's War, because he can be difficult for some people, though I'm sure not for you. I blurb Marriott's third book, Wither Fanon. In the blurb, I called him Frantz Fanon's first reader because Marriott is not burdened with the humanist desire that Fanon is burdened with. What we, Afro-pessimists, have done to read is to read Fanon with and against Fanon, to wallow in the contradictions of his cul-de-sacs, those moments when he is most afflicted by clientitis. In other words, in which psychoanalysis and psychiatry are his, are his clients so much so that he does not see how black non-being has thrown a monkey wrench in the gears of psychoanalysis's promise of transformation and psychic redemption, what in practice psychoanalysts call working through those places where Fanon himself cannot believe the evidence that he has presented. And since it gives him so much pain, like looking directly at the sun, he turns away and offers hope. Now, I say this, however, having been in and out of analysis for many years and having studied psychoanalysis at Columbia and UC Berkeley and taking courses in Berkeley at the Lacan School, just as, as I've studied Marxism and taught it. You should think of Afro-pessimism as a meta critique of psychoanalysis and Marxism, though it is much more than that as well. I hope this helps. Please do read David Marriott's On Black Men and then progress to his other works if you're interested in all of this. Um, he is one of my early teachers and remains so. He, Jared Sexton, Sora Han, Salamawet D. Terefe, and Lynette Park are the most important Afro pessimist thinkers who deal with psychoanalysis. And then I give this person an interview and say, take care. Um, all this, I'm, I'm, this redacted letters I'm, I'm showing you and sharing with permission of, of both myself and the writer. And then we'll wrap up with um, the response, which is quite interesting. Uh, dear Frank, I'm deeply grateful for your detailed, thoughtful and incisive reply. It was very generous of you. Your thinking and writing are definitely stretching my consciousness. The perspective of Afro-pessimism clearly challenges the premise of any transformative power psychoanalysis has when the signifier for blackness slash slaveness does not slide or move. I would definitely read the chapter from your book. Thank you. The selections from Fanon, Point Out, as well as Marriott. Uh, An Institute colleague, 
and she goes on to talk about having taught uh, taught uh, Silverman and um, Bersani. I am intensely interested in questioning, concerned about the idea that there has to be an ensemble of sentient beings who have no access to transformation because of their utterly subjugated position by a signifying violence at the hands of those for whom transformation is or has been possible. I've been a bit, I, I've done a fair bit of study in social and war trauma and the always already nature of that which cannot be spoken slash signified, as well as how the unspoken slash unsignified is spoken symptomatically, urgently into the unconscious field. So I welcome deepening my understanding of these issues as they pertain to African-Americans and the problem of anti-Blackness in the unconscious. The premise of Afro-pessimism not only makes analysis by white by a white analyst of a black person unthinkable, but questions the unconscious gratuitous violence that is perpetrated when white analysts treat white people or anyone. It implies psychoanalysis as, a, as an institutional structure simply perpetuates the rendering of blackness as abject in the unconscious. And then we want to have an invitation to come speak um, to our community. And my final reply is, I'd be happy to speak with you and members of your institute. I'm CC and my booking agent. But then I write, as far as an interlocutor is concerned, I'd be happy to do that, but with certain caveats. I'm not interested in working through a public presentation with a Black person where it looks like it'll be a staged conflict for non-Black eyes. So if the person has a serious bone to pick with Afro-pessimism or is too effectively hostile for, re for reasonable dialogue, then it probably would not be productive. Also, and this is categorical, I don't want to dialogue with a union no matter what color the person is. Uh, read Fanon's uh, one or two line dispatching of Jung in chapter five and you'll, and you'll know why I say this. I also don't want to speak with someone who's interested in Melanie Klein, object relations psychoanalysis. I prefer Freudian, especially someone who is invested in Freud's early topography or Lacanian. With these types of an analysis, at least me and the other person don't have to waste time recreating the wheel or arguing at ground zero about basic assumptions. So why did I say this, uh, bring in Freud's uh, early topography? Uh, and this will lead me to this next um, kind of diagram here. Precisely because I find this, this is um, a, a rather a bastardization of Freud's topography. Here is uh, the divided subject. And in his topography, as I learned from, from Silverman, we have three realms. The pre-conscious, conscious realm is the, the part of the brain and the mind of the subject, which I'm communicating with you and through right now. It's, it's, it's what I'm aware that I'm saying. I, every time I'm uh, making a sentence, I'm going to the warehouse of, of concepts that may not be right now in conscious mind, but are available to speech and bringing them into the conscious mind and speaking to you through that. And these elaborate uh, my interests. Um, uh, a, a more colloquial word would be, for example, identi identity, but identity is under the rubric of conscious interests, uh, clinically speaking, rather than under the rubric of number two, which is the realm of unconscious identification or desire fixation. And these two realms of the psyche, these two realms of the subject, as many of you know, are mobilized by two different um, strategies of signification. So in the pre-conscious mind, you have the strategies of, of what's called a secondary processes of signification where the mind and the writing and the speech pays close linguistic attention <clears throat> to the rules of grammar and to instantiating in the communication between two subjects, what's called um, returning the ideas to relational logic, where the unconscious mind also, as Lacan would say, operates like a language, but it's processes of signification would be called primary processes of signification in which condensation and displacement play uh, a greater role 
in the way it operates in primary processes of signification than in the conscious mind, which operates through a paradigm and a syntagmatic um, chains of speech. So through the unconscious mind is the mind of fixation, desire, identification. And this kind of signifying processes really does not pay attention to relational logic. It doesn't, it, it's, doesn't pay attention to the di logical division of concepts or images. It's more guided by a need to get as quickly as possible away from pain and towards pleasure. I would never argue that the black being gives um, validity or legibility to the human being that these two things are different because there is a radical difference between how the black realm number one, pre-conscious and conscious mind and the, and the black realm number two are so irreconcilably organized. They are, they're, they're more similar, especially at the pre-conscious than in the unconscious, but they're not, there's not a irreconcilable antagonism between black conscious thought and black unconscious thought on the one side and what we're calling human conscious thought and human unconscious thought. However, the third part of this diagram that you see at the very bottom. Um, my understanding is that Freud would normally label that memory. And why I have chosen to impose a different nomenclature on it, structural or paradigmatic position, is because in the psychoanalytic model, there's an assumption that structural or paradigmatic positioning of the subject does not have to be talked about, proven, described, articulated, for the simple reason that there is embedded in the assumptive logic of theories of subjectivity, a sense that every sentient being is recognized and incorporated into some kind of kinship structure. So in other words, the structure of the subject for most critical theory and almost all psychoanalysis would be the universal access to and positioning through a kinship structure. And our research and our interventions uh, interrogate that and suggest that that is actually not true. In other words, that kinship is not a universal possession of all sentient beings, that the slave is natally alienated, that natal alienation, which is to say the absence of being able to be recognized and incorporated into a kinship structure, whether that kinship structure is mapped over by Oedipus or whether it's mapped over by some more liberatory, emancipatory um, veneer, in the future, whatever it is, is that kinship is precisely the paradigmatic terrain which black subjects do not have access to. All right, what does that mean then? And why is that the case? And how does that get played out in day-to-day -day life? To address that question, if not necessarily answer it, satisfactorily, I'm going to share with you about six pages from my latest book, um, Afro-Pessimism. And without giving a long preamble to the scene that I'm going to share with you, because I think that given what I've shared with you in the diagram of the subject, and given what I shared with you in the um, correspondence between me and a, psycho and a psychoanalyst, that you'll see exactly how this dramatization resonates with what I've argued up to this point. This is taking place uh, exactly 20 years ago in uh, about February of 2001 in Santa Cruz, California. Here we go. 
Six months before the Twin Towers fell, I drove with Alice, a white woman who I first dated upon my return from living in South Africa for five years, then lived with and finally married. We drove down the rugged coast from Berkeley to a conference in Santa Cruz called the Raceway Rave. The realization that black suffering is of a different order than the suffering of other oppressed people and that black suffering is the life force of the world was waiting for the two of us 80 miles down the road. In February, 2001, as I said, Alice and I attended the race rave conference at the University of Santa Cruz. Between 200 and 300 activists, scholars, students, and people who were non-academic workers or precariously employed met to, quote, explore racism and the intersections of oppression to promote, to promote reparations and healing and to develop the framework for a truth and reconciliation process in the United States. It was billed as the first of a series of such gatherings on college campuses across the country. At the end of the day, we gathered in a large room. Sorry, one second. At the end of the day, we gathered in a large room. The two organizers told us to break up into groups that reflected how we were seen by the police. This meant that there would be a white group, a black group, a brown group, a red group or Native American group and a yellow group. I remember thinking at last, now we'll move from a politics of culture to a culture of politics. The whispers sent out by, the few, by a few of the black people seated near me confirmed my feelings. A sister near me sighed as though she had been holding her breath for the past day and a half and said, now we get to talk. A brother seated in front of her chuckled, didn't know black was in their vocabulary. The resistance started, however, before the exercise started. And it didn't come from the whites. It came from the non-Black people of color, the yellows, the browns, and the reds, who did not want to be known by their color, not even for two hours. They insisted that they were not simply colors, but cultural identities. In contrast, the Blacks, spurred by our joy at the opportunity to speak about the way state violence functions in our lives, were already at the door. But the commotion in the center of the room made us turn and look back. It felt as though a seismic tremor had cracked the party floor, split the room in half, leaving a small group of slaves adrift by the door while the humans argued about their cultural identities in the middle of the room. The non-Black people of color were angry. In a scene not unlike a presentation I had given earlier, uh, it, later, sorry, in Berlin, they demanded a say in how they were categorized. The organizers did their best to speak over those in the crowd who wouldn't listen. They said that being pigeonholed was the whole point, that the police treated you as a color and ignored your cultural and ethnic singularities. And the point of the exercise was to assume that formation and see what came of the discussion. That's the exercise, they said. Let's get to it. Right on roared up from the Blacks waiting in the wings. And it might have gone down like that, but something unexpected happened. One group of people who had formed part, formed part of this scrum of discontent became more vocal than the rest. But they didn't voice their objections on the basis of cultural integrity. In fact, they mobilized the same terms as the organizers, race. But they mobilized race in service to the aims and objectives of the non-Black people of color who insisted on a politics of culture versus the culture of politics that had animated the Black folks. It was weird, but it worked. They were biracial, one Black parent and one white parent, and they didn't want to be pigeonholed as though as Black, though they didn't say that they would be just as irate to be pigeonholed as white. As I watched the so-called biracial, half-black, half-white people make their case for why they did not want to be grouped as black, I was struck by how their argument in no way resembled the logic of the people of color, and by how little that mattered, meaning no one checked them on this contradiction. 
rather than assert the specificity of their cultural heritage and ethnic origins and why the catch-all colors assigned to them would be an erasure of those cultural markers, the biracial people argued that the four colors, red, white, brown, and black, did not account for them. They were neither black nor white. They were both, they said, and as amalgamations, they deserved their own room. The two organizers were stymied, stunned, but not by the argument. A child could have countered by simply saying, none of y'all look like zebras. No pig would put you in a lineup of white perps or blast you in the shoulder instead of the heart because he could tell your mama was white. Y'all read black. So go to the black room and stop wasting our time. Perhaps the child would have said it without the clarity and rancor that I have imposed, but nonetheless, is not a difficult objection to handle, especially given the fact that the biracial people did not interrogate the assumptive logic as was the case with the others. They simply said, you haven't given us the right color room. So why did the organizers look like deer in headlights? And more importantly, what made them cave in? It was the affect, the verve, the energy, the bodily performance of the biracial contingent. They postured and gesticulated in a manner more stereotypically black than biracial. In other words, their loud talk, their indignation, their runaway slave rage made the organizers quake. It was a different affect than the affect of the people of color. The non-blacks had pleaded, whined, cajoled. The biracial contingent, to quote, Queen Latifah got buck with the motherfuckers. They pressed a hyperbolic NWA performance of blackness into service of their desire to be as far away from blackness as they could be. It worked like a charm. The organizers confronted with the sound and fury of black rage, cynically divorced from black desire, gave the biracial people their own room. And by necessity, they caved into the other people who wanted to be grouped by culture, not color. Black affect, or rather, the black exploitation of black affect, had been weaponized for the death of black desire. Each group was given the same sheet of paper with the same instructions and discussion topics. The sheet of <clears throat> the sheet of paper also indicated included a charge. We were to come up with ways to talk about what happened in our breakaway groups with our allies when we returned to plenary 90 minutes later. The first thing the Blacks did when we were alone and the door was closed was to tear that sheet of paper up and throw it away. We realized that the regime of violence through which we were subjugated could not be reconciled with the regime of violence that subjugated our so-called allies. And what had happened in the auditorium confirmed this. In other words, what the organizers had unleashed was a realization that oppression has two, not one, regimes of, of violence. The violence that subjugates the subaltern, meaning people of color who are not black, and the violence that subjugates the slave or the black. So once we had been liberated, once we had liberated ourselves from the constraints of having to make our suffering analogous to the suffering of the people of color, something truly profound occurred. For me, someone who was beginning to move from Marxism to what would a year later be called Afro-pessimism, the session was instructive because I was able to see and feel how comforting it was for a room full of Black people to move between the spectacle of police violence to the banality of microaggressions at work and in the classroom, to the experience of shadow slavery as if the time and intensity of all three were the same. No one, absolutely no one, said, hey, hold on. For example, when a, one, when a young woman said she was forced to breastfeed all the white people at her job like she'd done on the plantation, no one said, now you're speaking metaphorically, right? The room simply said, amen, and right on. The time of chattel slavery was the time of our lives. 
And this was not a problem, as some psychoanalysts would have it, of neurotic conflation between the imaginary and the, and the symbolic. In other words, this was not a failure of our collective psyches to restore state violence to relational logic. To separate, that is, the time of chattel slavery from the time of discrimination, to separate the space of the whipping post from the cartography of the office. No, it was a collective recognition that the time and space of chattel slavery shares essential aspects with the time and space, the violence of our modern lives. Folks cried and laughed and hugged each other, called out for the end of the world. No one poured cold, cold water on this by asking, what does that mean, the end of the world? How can you say that? Where's that going to leave us? Or how will we make sense of the end of the world when we go back to speak with our allies? <clears throat> The dangerous fuse of black imagination had been lit by nothing more than the magic of an intramural conversation. No one wanted it to end. With 30 minutes left in our session, a sense of dread set in. The organizers would soon be calling us back into that dreaded auditorium. Someone floated the idea of not returning, of just going home. But someone else came up with a better idea. We would go back into the plenary and refuse to speak with them. Not a protest, just a silent acknowledgement of the fact that we would not corrupt what we experienced with their demand for articulation between their grammar of suffering and ours. Now there was moot outside our door. But when we opened the door, when we, but we, sorry, now there was movement outside our door. We looked up thinking that the organizers had recalled us early. But when we opened the door, we found that it wasn't the organizers, but the entire group of biracial people, people whose hyperbolic blackness had rescued them from our room. They were greeted with grunts and cold stares. One of them asked if they could come in. Silence. I broke the silence by saying, you never left. They entered and sat down, cautiously. We made room for them, just as cautiously. We asked them why they decided to join us. The discussion had centered on the presumptuous notion that they could access the social capital of civil society. Their talk had been vertically integrated from discussions about what a special place on this US census would mean for their mobility and their quest for recognition on what they had described as their own terms to the gut-wrenching conflicts they experienced in the tussle of allegiance in their individual family lives. In other words, how do we honor both parents, both our white and black cultural heritages? But this discussion didn't have the gravitas needed for 90 minutes. So Eventually, they had turned to the topic that they had been given, their relationship to an experience with police violence. It wasn't long before they realized that to meditate on this through their biracialism wasn't going to get them anywhere. No cop had ever said, look here, I'm going to shoot you in the shoulder, not the heart, because you're only half black. When we returned to plenary, the room took note of us, all of us. Someone said, I want some of what, that, some of what that group has, but we hadn't spoken a word. Another person said, look at all that love. We still had not spoken. A third person said, so what's up with y'all? Every one of you is glowing. The organizers asked us who had been designated as the spokesperson of our, for our group. I raised my hand. They asked me for our report. I said, we have decided to remain silent. They wanted to know why. We've decided to remain silent, I repeated. Can you say anything? They asked. 
I said all that I had been mandated to say, which is, we had a good session. Well, we can see that, they said. Then they asked the biracial group to speak. One of them said, well, we ended up joining the black group. Now the room was even more puzzled, but no explanations were forthcoming. It went south from there. The whites reported on their bric-a-brac dialogue. Alice had had her head handed to her. No one in her, in her room was willing to think of themselves as white in relation to policing. The white women said it was important to divide the room along gender lines and have a discussion about how women fare under patriarchy. Several other people said they were Jewish and perhaps they should have pressed the organizers for their own, own room as the biracial people had done. One white man actually said that it was important for them to do a round robin in which each white person would say what state they lived in before they came to California. To Alice's horror, damn near everyone in the white room thought this was a good idea. One by one, they began to shout the names of states where they were born and raised, and they would have descended into personal narratives about how and when they came to California and what brought them there had my wife Alice not exploded. This doesn't have a damn thing to do with our relationship to, police, to the institution of policing, she said. Let's get back on track. But no one was willing to get back on track. The interesting thing about the trajectory of the conversation in the white room was the way it uncannily mirrored the conversation, the absolute refusal of the exercise that was going on in the black room, albeit for different reasons. Alice was shut down because the exercise threatened the most constituent element of whiteness. White people are the police. This includes whites, those whites who, like Alice, at the level of pre-conscious consciousness, do not want this birthright deputization, deputation. At a deep unconscious level, they all intuited the fact that the police were not out there, but in here, that policing was woven into the fabric of their subjectivity. No wonder the discussion veered in mirrored directions away from a conscious encounter with this horrifying aspect of their structural position into a chorus of declarations about gendered identities and stories about their individual sojourns to California. And conversely, the Black people in their room at the other end of the hall understood that no kind of psychic or material immigration would ever be expansive enough to open such doors to them, to Alice and her people. But for the non-Black people of color, this question of access remained an open one. The Asians, Latinos, and Native, and Native Americans' discussions had begun with questions of violence and ended with questions of access, such as immigration policy. Spanish in the schools, the question of indigenous gambling casinos, and the question of land and sovereignty. It was clear the articulation, that the articulation was between the whites whose access to civil society was so unquestioned that they had no reason to complain about it or question the regime of violence that fortified and extended it, and their junior partners who were anxious for expanded access. None of these groups embodied an antagonism to civil society itself. What they embodied were gradations of marginalization. The antagonism was not between them and the police, but between all of them and all of us, even the ones who wanted their own room. Even the two organizers were wrong, for which is, which is to say the exercise was right, if only accidentally right. The organizers had divided the room, had divided people based on their color and how the gaze of the police perceives them. But only one group of people is essentially elaborated and subjugated by this kind of gratuitous violence. The blacks, the slaves, 
For all the other groups of people, there's a certain contingency that interrupts as well as makes legible the violence of the state. These people must transgress or be perceived to transgress the law before the anvil of state violence falls on their heads. But for the blacks, the slaves, no notion of transgression is necessary. The pleasure of maiming black bodies is its own reward. It is this pleasure that divided the conference not into five colors, but into two species, blacks and humans. But the cognitive maps of the people at the race rave conference could not comprehend or explain this a priori division of species between the human and the slave. The black people and ultimately the biracial, yes, black people knew this, if only for the most part, intuitively. But the terrain wasn't fertile enough for that knowledge to flourish. The black people were shackled to the cognitive maps of their well-meaning masters. So before I open it to um, some questions, I want to close with a poem that resonates with what I'm saying here. This poem is called The Convocation of Conquest. And um, it's in a chapbook of poetry that I have published through Commune Press in Berkeley. It's actually um, this, um, Chapbook is available, the whole book online for free. Uh, it also has recently um, been translated into Danish of all things. And so uh, those of you who speak Danish can uh, email me and get a copy from the publisher. Let me share this with you. The Convocation of Conquest. My chair was missing from the table, an oversight I'm sure. Standing there, I considered the distance we'd walked just to arrive and the horses apathetic to the prey of their riders, gaining in spite of themselves with heads so enormous, cold mist from their nostrils fell upon the moon, upon you and me and the men and women we took with us from the corners of sleep. One dream, one table, one people with one unnameable loss and no place set, even aside. Thank you all very much. Hi, Ken. Thank you so much, Frank. That was terrific. And actually, before we uh, continue with questions, could I ask you to please uh, share the diagram that you uh, had early on? Because I'm afraid people didn't get a chance to see it. It didn't come through. Oh, I'm so yeah. sorry about that. Yes. Yeah, so that people have a chance to see it. And maybe uh, gloss it just a little bit again. So. Yeah, you know. OK. That. Uh, thank you for saying that. Okay, now are you, are you actually seeing it now? Yes, now we see it. Oh, yes. Okay, well that's good because it actually um, it actually uh, kind of loops us back into the, the vignette and, and the poem. So thank you for bringing this up. Uh, to, to gloss over, you know, um, I'm, I'm stealing from Freud and distending his calculus here. So this is, <laughs> this is, this is a distended uh, bastardization, you probably say, of his first topography, uh, in, in, which I think is more interesting than, than ego, superego, and id, uh, in which he would have the preconscious as that area of the mind that, that works through what I said were secondary processes of signification, which you and I can are talking through right now. Uh, we have to agree to repress our desire to uh, put objects and verbs in the wrong places and, and adjectives so that we can communicate with each other. It's, it's, a, it's a part of uh, signification in the brain that, that relies upon um, 
returning everything and restoring everything to relational logic. Then you have that part of the brain. And of course, you can't take a knife, I'm smart enough to know, and, and divide up the skull and actually find these little pieces. Uh, but for methodological purposes, this is what, how we operate. The unconscious um, works through primary processes of signification like dreams and uh, intense uh, identification, which is different than identity, which would be part of what was going on in the, in the conference. People are saying, I have an identity as a Latinx person, which is really not identification, it's interests. Mm -hmm. um, because identification is really something you can't uh, control. You could call yourself a red-blooded, uh, all-American, heterosexual, homophobic, person and uh, then find yourself uh, watching John Wayne and your unconscious mind is giving you a stimulus that you actually want to have sex with John Wayne. So uh, identification then works in contradistinction to identity. Um, and that's and so that's another realm. But this third realm is normally, um, you know, from, I haven't done a lot of, of deep, deep, deep reading for about a year as so I've been on tour, but normally called like memory. And, and why I made it paradigm is precisely because it assumes two things, if you call it memory. It assumes that everybody has a childhood because everyone had kin. So this there is struck, there is a kind of paradigmatic assumption in psychoanalysis. It's just not spoken. It's that we all are elaborated through a kinship structure. And what the theory of social death, which is elaborated in um, Orlando Patterson's seminal uh, corrective of slavery studies published by Harvard in 1982, slavery and social death does, he said, no, 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 no. In order for you to think, in order for there to be kinship and it to be legible as a concept, there has to be a conceptual terrain in which certain sentient beings do not have access to kinship. And that is natal alienation. And so what my vignette that I just read interrogates is and tries to elaborate is that here at the level of structural position or paradigmatic position, there is the slave who exists in an A, that's A signifying, all one word, A signifying soup of violence, a kind of violence that needs to be ritually, ritualistically acted, enacted upon the slave through generation through generation, even if the technologies change and the chains come off in 1865, these rituals have to continue. Chauvin's knee on Floyd's neck is not a form of discrimination. It is a, it is is a practice of ritualistic murder, which contributes to the psychic well-being of the rest of the world because they would, under, in order to make the rest of the world understand that if that were to happen to me, there would have to be a reason, contingency. So this is, this is the part that divides the human from the slave. And that's what I was trying to get at. Is that okay? Great, that's really helpful. Thank you for doing that. Uh, okay. We may get some more questions based on, on uh, now having seen it, but um, I've got so many questions from our audience that I should start with some others. I uh, see 240 people. I hope they're not 240 questions. <laughs> uh, I think there's actually more like 250 people, but in any case. <laughs> so let's begin. Dr. Wilderson, can you explain how violence against non-Black groups would be categorized in an Afro-pessimist framework. Can you also explain the use of collateral in the Afro-pessimist framework? I'm on chapter four of the book, and this is one of the questions that I've had throughout. Uh, I, I would need to know what chap is, is this person in chapter four of, of Afro-pessimism or a red yeah. light? Oh, okay, I all right. I think that's the implication. Okay, all right. Um, Sorry, uh, Ken, leaving out the stuff about collateral, can you just repeat the first part so I can- Yeah, I, I think that's easier to, you know, understand yeah. what you're getting at. In any case, um, can you explain how violence against non-Black groups yeah. would be categorized in an Afro-pessimist framework? Yes, okay. And, and thank you for that, uh, viewer and listener. Uh, I'm gonna gloss over it because there are many questions. And what I will say is that, 
the word that I have used in my second book, which which is a deeper theoretical dive, red, white, and black, than this one, Afro-Pessimism, is a book for the general public. Uh, but the word that I promote in that book is uh, contingent. So I would put the adjective of contingent in front of the word violence when talking about um, the people at the Race Rave Conference who are obviously um, destroyed and killed by the police and who suffer things like lynching. But what, but what I would say is that in the first ontological moment, uh, these being come into being through discourse like Lacan's and Fon's uh, from the age of like say um, six to 18 months acquires language and gives up their kind of polymorphously perverse status as uh, a person who is just at, totally at one with the world and becomes a, uh, a subject of human relations. And that person as a subject of human relations then gives up their life in Lacanian language for a place in the symbolic order, for a place in language. And it is that place in language, which is, um, oftentimes, unless you're a certain type of, of highly exalted white male, in some way that place in language is going to be subordinated to someone else's place in language. So the woman's place is going to be subordinated to the man's place. The Latinx person's place is going to be subordinated to the white person's place. But, it's, but it, the subordination comes through discourse. And then the violence that they experience is triggered by transgression real or imagined by those who hold the power of the symbolic order. What I said earlier when Ken asked me to go back to the diagram is that violence operates in a irreconcilable way with the black subject, with, with the black non-subject or the slave. Violence is necessary in a whimsical way to not produce disciplinary regimes that the, that the colored subject must go back into or that the woman must be disciplined back into a symbolic subordinate place. But anti-Black violence marks a body or flesh for whom assault is, is perpetrated against for no contingent reason so that other people know that kind of thing can happen to me, but I am alive. I'm alive as human because there would have to be contingency. And I would encourage you to go to Red, White, and Black for a, um, a longer explanation of that, uh, as well as the work of David Marriott, as I said before. Okay. Great, thank you. That was terrifically helpful. Um, here's another question. Is it legitimate to equate blackness with slavery in other geocultural areas than the US? What about the African immigrants to the US or about black Africans in Africa? Do they also not belong to a kinship or is this only related to black ex-slave Americans? Well, this is probably the bad rap that Afro-pessimism gets, that it's, that it's US centric. <laughs> and I would encourage people who actually think that to uh, go to the townships of say Kailiche in Cape Town and Soweto and uh, Hobnob with a mass movement called the Landless People's Movement or um, uh, Black First Land First um, to see what they're reading. And uh, what they're reading is Afro-pessimism because what they understand are two things. One is that what we have done is to really highlight the way we think about slavery in non-empirical terms. So, and this is, this is largely due to Orlando Patterson's um, Slavery and Social Death, in which he says, every book of, that defines slavery up until my book, Slavery and Social Death, has actually given us reportage, has reported on the experience of being chained, picking cotton, chopping sugarcane, or being whipped. Has, they've reported on an experience and they have not explicated a relational dynamic. A relational dynamic is something that cannot be seen that makes the paradigm of domination legible. And so what we're, what we're arguing to, to directly answer the, the questioner is that 
this relational dynamic uh, building a, and borrowing from Patterson is not about chains. It's not about plantations. It's not about whippings. And it's not about the American South, even though those are the, some of the experiences of slavery. What describes slavery as a relational dynamic are NATO alienation, which is to say, no matter what is in your head, in those two realms called the conscious or the unconscious mind. The third realm, in that third realm, you cannot be recognized and incorporated as kin for other people. Natal alienation, general dishonor, which is to get back to my earlier response to the first question, which is to say that you are dishonored in your skin, not in your actions, which is to say like the N word, there's no transformative capacity for you. Honor is not a question. You cannot do something like rob a bank to become dishonorable. Your blackness is dishonorable. And gratuitous violence, which is to say rituals of, of you, you have to be, you are open and vulnerable to the society of masters, not just the police, because that open vulnerability marks your difference between those who are vulnerable contingently. And that what I just described is a paradigmatic organization that maps the entire world, wherever the Black diaspora is, even though the technologies of its performance vary greatly. So that's what would be my answer. Thank you. Um, here's an, another interesting question. Does the, an, un, this is a hard word to say, does the unanalogizable, <laughs> did I say that? <laughs> grammar of suffering at stake in Blackness imply an equally unanalogizable grammar of struggle. Yeah, well, yeah, but I can't answer that without uh, going to jail for sedition. But, so I'll just say, <laughs> I'll just say, yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah, yes. Because, because I mean, I'll, 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 try to, I'll try to dance through that with, you know, without the FBI getting too much more that they, that they want. Yeah, I mean, this, this person has like hit the, the, the nail on the nerve, actually, yeah. uh, because everyone else in that room at the race rave is struggling to undo injustices in the world. That's how they get redress. That's what they embody. Um, but Blackness embodies an antagonism with the world itself regardless of how it's orga organized. In other words, there are people, there are sentient beings who have the capacity to transpose endless duration into the event and limitless space into place. And, and if you read the, the, the majority decision from Justice Taney of Dred Scott, why he's sending Dred Scott back to back to slavery, he makes, this, he makes it very, very clear. He says, look, Indians, Native Americans are the lowest form of humans that you, can, that you can imagine, but they are humans. And if we can make them better people by helping to make them white, they can immigrate into our polity. But I am sending Dred Scott back to slavery because you law courts heard the case of someone who has no standing in subjectivity. Thank you. That was uh, eloquent. Uh, here's an interesting question. I'm afraid we'll only be able to take a couple more. Um, how does Afro-pessimist meta theory of the black subject differ from a white supremacist theory or so-called proof of chattel slavery? Well, I'm not a student of white supremacist proof, so I mean, I, I, mean, I, I, I I think there's a little dig in that question. I mean, I, I you know, I, I, why don't they just come out and say, I don't like what you're saying, you know, as opposed to asking a, a goddamn question. I'll, I'll pass on that one. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> How about this one? Does a class analysis fit into Afro-pessimism or does it say all black people, no matter their class, is, uh, is are in a position of slave? Also, what, does this say, well, let's just leave it at that for now, okay? Yeah, yeah, okay, that's a very good one because I, you know, I started off um, uh, as a as a uh, political educator person for uh, underground structures um, 
guerrilla cells and above ground structures in, in Marxism when I was in South Africa and slowly inculcated into, into psychoanalysis when I got back here. Um, so let me put it very succinctly because I know we're running out of time. Um, Marxism and the way it describes suffering is important to black suffering and inessential to it. Marxism, the way it describes suffering is important because 90% of the black people in the world are poor and working class. So of course, you're going to need a Marxist analysis unless you're going to be some kind of, you know, pie in the sky, Pollyannish uh, neoliberal like, like Biden who thinks that a jobs program is gonna do something, okay? You're, you, you need a Marxist analysis, but you also need a level of abstraction that is meta to understand how it cannot fully address black suffering. And so what, how Afro-pessimism started, and I'm sorry, I didn't really get a chance to go into to all this. We, we, you know, I would have, if my computer hadn't acted up, uh, is, you know, Jared Sexton, Sorhan, uh, Zakia Mon Jackson, who I hear is gonna be there soon. Um, uh, uh, Kiana Ross, who teaches at, at Northwestern. We we're all uh, graduate students at UC Berkeley. Uh, well, sorry, Kiana Ross and Sora Han, who Sora Han would be the new chair of African American Studies. She works at UC Irvine. She was an undergrad, and Kiana Ross was an undergrad. She's at Northwestern. But we're all in these political struggles in the San Francisco, Berkeley, Oakland Bay area. And what we were seeing was that um, it was impossible to uh, get multiracial groups to entertain the singularity of black suffering, there was a hydraulics that made them all want us to think that we were all oppressed through economic dispossession. And so that is rather uh, simplistic, number, number one. But I also come back to say, we, we were taking classes in uh, at the, us graduate students in psychoanalysis and Marxism. And one of the things that, that I um, began to understand is that we Americans are far too empirical in the way that we study anything. And this is why the theoretical Marxists coming out of Italy and uh, Germany are so important because they don't need real empirical examples to work through relational dynamics. Uh, we, it would be, uh, I'll take two minutes to say that, it would, it would be a bad theoretical Marxist uh, would say that a sweatshop worker who is Latinx and dying on the job south of the Rio Grande um, is structurally and essentially different than a Swedish professor in, in Stockholm who has all kinds of, of safety nets and social network kind of, of transfer of payments, okay? They are different in their lived experience, but they are both the hosts of a parasite called capitalism, which drains surplus value from their bodies through the same kind of mechanism, okay? The same generative mechanism. So whether you are Oprah Winfrey or Condoleezza Rice, two women who I could not agree with, uh, much with, or Colin Powell, or myself or someone living in Compton, okay? You are, you are living a different day-to-day -day experience of anti-Blackness, but you are still subjugated by the same structure which can never ever incorporate you into a relational dynamic. For that to happen, other people who suffer white supremacy would be the same as people who suffer anti-Blackness. And anti-Blackness and white supremacy are two radically different things and we should not confuse them. White supremacy is the violence of police against people of color who transgress the law. Anti-Blackness is the violence of, of anyone against black people simply because no transgression necessary. Thank you. Um, I think maybe we can have one more question. What do you say? Sure. Um, this is, I think, a, you know, a, a question that's understandable. Um, I recently finished Afro-pessimism and I can't help but feel and also agree with the sense of hopelessness that the theory invokes. Do you believe that the Earth's heat death is the only thing that will end the plight of the black non-subject? <laughs> well, <laughs> say, say the la I, I, I kind of laughed through the last few words. Do, do I believe the, the, was, was it global warming or something? Or what, 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 yeah, basically uh, ecological disaster. So 
But I think the heart of the question is the first part, you know, the sense yeah. of hopelessness. Uh, it really depends on who you are. I mean, you know, I was, I was at, uh, at a, I was at, at a bookstore in uh, Berkeley about 12 years ago, um, uh, reading from my book Incognito, and an Iranian woman, uh, you know, who is a down revolutionary, someone who I love dearly, said, you know, I read your work, it gives me a sense of, 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 of hopelessness. And um, before I could intervene, two Black people shot up, and they said, it gives us a sense of recognition and hope. Um, the, the point of the matter is, and this is what pisses me off about multiracial coalitions, um, no one is really willing to engage Black suffering. What they want to do is harness the kind of iconoclastic rage that comes from a body of flesh that cannot be incorporated into their movements for access to civil society and then jettison it at the end of the day. So Black what gives me joy might just terrify you. Well, I think that will have to do it for this evening. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure to have you. And uh, I want to thank the Hammer and their fabulous staff once again. And uh, I look forward to more conversation. Thank you. And Ken, I'm just going to run to the restroom and I'll see you in about two minutes, okay? Sounds good. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you to everyone at the hammer. Okay. Bye-bye.